So what Hanna Pekash is replacing its utility lines. The existing utility lines, water lines, power lines, sewer lines were put in in the late 1950s and they're old and corroding. So we're testing all along the lines, about 9,000 feet of that with, uh, with deep sort of probes that'll go down to about a meter and a half deep to see if in the process of replacing those lines, uh, subsurface buried archaeological properties might exist, prehistoric particularly we're interested in. And lo and behold, along that line we found four intact. These were the first archaeological pre-contact, pre prehistoric archaeological sites ever documented at Mount Rainier, below 2,000 feet. Mount Rainier is famous, at least geologically and archaeologically too, for having stratified layer cake stratigraphy laid down over thousands of years from repeated volcanic eruptions of Mount Rainier and St. Helens. That allows us then, when we can find chipstone tool remains, to relate them to the various volcanic events and get some rough idea how old they are. It's really handy, kind of a technique to use, and it works relatively well. That's why we, that's why we dig deep, and that's why we use 10 liter samples recording the depth as we go and the nature of the volcanic layering in which they're found as we go down. And, and at Ohanabakash, we were fortunate enough on four of the, I think initially 100, roughly 100 test units, four of them had chipstone material. All of them appeared to be deep, relatively deeply buried, below 60 centimeters and below a volcanic event from Mount St. Helens that dates to about 3,700 years ago, and above a volcanic event from Mount Rainier that dates to 6,400 years ago. This is interesting in a couple of ways. Well, first of all, they're pretty old. You know, somewhere in that 3,000 or so year range. And the second thing is that none of them seem to be, there was no sites up higher in time. It implied that of the sample of four that we were able to find, that the, the landscape was used um, to some extent at a period of time between 6,400 years and 3,700 years, and that you know, from the sample of four, there wasn't any use of the area after that small sample still, but it's the only sample we've had so far, so that was pretty interesting in itself. The coolest things we could find, I think, at the site is not only the things that we find, but what they tell us about the past. So the things that we found that I regard as particularly informative and particularly interesting are two intact hearth features. That's our, those are campfires that people sat around between 3,000 and 6,000 or so years ago and, and did things. You know, hearths campfires in prehistoric context, that's where everything happens. It's their source of heat, their source of light, their source of conversation, manufacturing goes on there, cooking goes on there, everything happens around the hearth. It's a big deal. Dwellings are located around hearths too because they can take advantage of that heat. Temporary dwellings, permanent, whatever they are. So whenever you can find a hearth, find a campfire, in subsurface context you found something pretty cool because of what it can tell you. You can tell you, first of all, you've got direct human involvement in the creation of that feature. The wood that they burned in that hearth, it dates that hearth directly. So we can do radiocarbon dating of that wood that was burned in that fire, and we'll know within 100 years or so when that hearth was actually used. So we, can have, the, we have the volcanic layering that gives us the 3,000-year window, and the radiocarbon will get it down to 100 years. We have pretty good understanding of why Mount Rainier was important to people in the prehistoric past. It was important largely because of productive resources and upper elevation habitats. We would never had much focus on lower, no indication of people focusing their attention on lower elevation habitats though, until now. So that, that created a lot of re interesting research opportunities for us in the park. We didn't, re for example, was trying to understand why Ohanapakash would have been important. Was Ohanapakash a salmon-bearing river, for example? So folks were coming up, camping out there, exploiting salmon, bringing them out, cleaning them, drying them, carrying them back somewhere else. Were they transit stops on the way to higher elevation landscapes? People can't just fly up there. They've got to walk and they've got to stay overnight in some places, possibly. Was it useful during a period after vegetation was suppressed by a burn or landslides or volcanic event or something like that that made it useful for a short period of time. And all of those were questions we could address from the Hanapakash project. The kind of interests in archaeology that sustains you over the long run, has sustained me over the long run, as I'm getting to be an old guy here, is not so much the artifacts, although they're cool themselves, but it's the puzzle. It's the, 
It's what they can tell you about human uses of the past. We're really trying to understand how human beings used a place on the planet over a long period of time and do it in a way that has some scientific validity to it. It's not just a story. So it's, it's very fun to find artifacts, don't get me wrong. But what's really fun and what really lasts, really does, in the long run, is these complex puzzles that you can kind of work out, the brain games that you can play with these and try to develop an understanding of how people use the planet. You know, and do it in a way that can be scientifically rejected you know, and improved. So, you know, Canopy Kosh fits into that. Fits in nicely. It's really cool.